first five verses of Acts chapter 12 this morning. <clears throat> now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And that was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison. I like this. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Herod the ruler decided to mistreat some of the people of God, as we read here. Just a little bit of a history lesson. You know, I never much enjoyed history when I was in school. I kind of like history a lot better when I'm not graded for it. So I want to give you just a little bit of a history lesson. I think this is important in framing our story. So Herod that we just read about here in verse 1 was, and if you can see that chart, which you probably can't because that's pretty small text there, but he was really Herod Agrippa the first. Herod Agrippa I was born in the year 10 BC, and he was the grandson of Herod the Great. I don't know if the people called him great or he called himself great, but if you're uh, that kind of absolute ruler, you don't argue with the phrase. So he was the great. And what you know about Grandpa Herod was he was the Herod that slaughtered all the male infants in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. All oh, that Herod. Pretty nasty dude. So that was the grandfather of this Herod that we're reading about here. Now, he was a bad guy in more ways than one. He assassinated his own son, the father of Agrippa I that we're reading about here, when Agrippa was only three years old. I don't know what it was he had against dad, but anyway, he killed him. Now, there was another Herod you need to know about, if you can see that there, Herod Agrippa II, the son of this Herod that we're reading about today. It would be that Herod that the Apostle Paul would stand before, as we read later on in Acts. Okay, so three Herods that I think are kind of helpful for us to know a thing or two about. Now, Herod Agrippa I that we're reading about here in chapter 12 and this sounds like some news right out of the current administration and our own government. He had some bad business dealings in Rome. You know, after dad was killed off when he was only three years old, Herod's mom takes him to Rome. And as he grows up, anyway, he gets involved in some bad business deals. He racks up a huge debt. And apparently many people bailed him out. But uh, there were debt collectors after him. And so after mom died, he headed off to Palestine. And apparently he was a pretty shrewd guy because he maneuvered and finagled things so that he was appointed to a government position. Eventually, he maneuvered himself to be appointed as ruler over Judea and Samaria, where he was in the story that we look at here today. He was very, very supportive of Jewish policies. He was a man that wanted to win the favor of the Jews, and so he went to great lengths, apparently even tried to keep some of the, the Jewish laws and so forth, so he really acted very much like a Jew. The Jews, as we've been reading, were very much opposed to Christianity, the followers of Christ. And so as one who was dedicated to the Jews, he also strongly opposed the followers of Christ, and that endeared him even more to the Jews. So as we read here, he decided to put James to death. James is the brother of John, the two disciples of Jesus. Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. Mark chapter 3, verse 17. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Sons of thunder. I think that means they were not wallflowers. They were not guys to just kind of hang back. These were guys that were probably out there saying things, doing things, controversial figures. So maybe we understand a little bit about why Herod had James killed. Too much to say, too much to do. We don't, we're speculating, but as one of the sons of thunder, it was important, I guess, for Herod to get him out of the way. By the way, James and John, uh, John their mother, as you might recall, was the one that came to Jesus and said, by the way, in the kingdom... I want you to give my boys thrones on either side. 
I would say she was kind of a Marie Barone, if you know what I'm talking about there. So anyway, that's the James and John that we're talking about here. So if Herod did opinion polls, and he seems like the kind of a ruler that did, killing James was very, very popular with the Jews that he was ruling over. So as we read, he arrested Peter. And he had Peter guarded with a rotation of 16 soldiers, four squads, it says here. One man, 16 soldiers. Sounds a lot like overkill, but we know that Peter had this knack of getting broken out of jail anyway. And so probably they knew about that. So this time, he's not going to get away with it. We're told in the passage we read, this all happened around Passover. Jesus was arrested and actually was killed during Passover. And that was kind of an irregular thing. Of course, it fit with God's plan. But it was otherwise forbidden in Jewish practice to execute someone during Passover. So again, Herod, who wanted to please the Jews, decided let's wait on the death sentence. So he puts him in prison, no doubt intending that he's going to kill him after that. Peter is in prison, but the church is fervently praying for him. And we might pause and say, well, did the church not pray for James? We're not told that they did or that they didn't. We might imagine that James was arrested and executed so hastily, perhaps they didn't have time. But anyway, Peter's in prison. It looks like a death sentence for him. Picking up in verse 6. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now, there's some things about Peter in this passage, in these verses that we just read, that really strike me in a kind of a peculiar way. The night before he potentially is to be executed, you notice it says he's sleeping. Not only is he sleeping, he is chained to two guards. Now just kind of visualize that. I'm a side sleeper. That wouldn't work well. But he's chained between two guards, not able to move his hands and his arms, and he's sleeping. That seems like an absurd situation. P Peter seems like the kind of guy that probably could take a nap just about anywhere. Because there's a, there's a history of his nap taking. The Transfiguration, you're familiar with that passage. Luke chapter 9, verse 32, this amazing thing with Jesus. Luke 9, 32 says he's there in a deep sleep. There again, how do you sleep at a moment like that? The Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in his time of trial, he says, watch and pray. He says to all of his apostles. But they all are sleeping, Peter included. How could Peter be sound asleep in prison, chained to two guards the night before he potentially is to be executed? Here's a thought that I want to share with you to think about. John chapter 21, verse 18. You may want to check this out on your own, but I think this is very, very interesting why Peter could have a good night of sleep. Jesus said to Peter, I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. 
But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. And by this, he indicated how Peter was going to die. Jesus had made that statement probably only a few months before he's put in prison, as we're reading about in Acts 12. Peter, I would think, is imagining Jesus said, I won't die until I'm an old man and I'll die by crucifixion. I'm not an old man yet. It wasn't that long ago he said that. Is that a part of why Peter could sleep soundly, knowing his time was not yet? He took the words of Jesus to heart and could sleep soundly in those circumstances. I think that's an amazing possibility. And as I think about it, I wonder, do we take the words of Jesus and the promises of Jesus to heart in such a way that we might also be able to be at peace in circumstances that would indicate otherwise? This just reminds me of Psalm 4, verse 8, where the psalmist says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. I think Peter could have echoed that, saying, my Lord Jesus Christ alone has made me to dwell in safety. I'm still a young man. I'm not an old man yet. I know I'm, how I'm going to die, and I know about what time of life I will die. But I can take his words to heart, and I can lie down, and I can rest. I just think that is absolutely an amazing thought to consider. So the rest of what we just read, the most miraculous jailbreak of all. And again, this reflects on Peter, the sound sleeper. It says an angel appeared in the cell and shone a light. Now, just think about that for a few moments. Most of us, when we're asleep, if somebody came in the room and turned on the lights, wouldn't that be enough to wake us up? Peter's still sleeping. Because look at what else we just read. The angel struck him on the side to wake him up. Talk about a sound sleep. The light coming on didn't make the difference. It took the angel actually hitting him to wake him up. What a sound sleeper. And so the angel strikes him on the side, says, get up, Peter. The chains with the two prison guards immediately drop off. The angel basically says, get your shoes on, get your coat. We're headed out. They walk by one stand of guards. Remember, there were 16 of them, so probably there's one unit out there a little ways. They walk right by them, didn't pay any attention. Walk by a second group of them, didn't pay any attention. And then I like this. They go by a gate. They go to a gate that is locked, and it says it opened by itself. This is the very first Walmart-type automatic door. The gate opened all by itself. I could picture that thing swinging out there. He walks out, swings back shut. They go a little ways, and he thinks it's a dream the whole time. This is a pretty cool dream, but it's a dream. The angel departs, and they're out on a street, and all of a sudden he realizes this is the real deal. And so he goes to where the church is praying. Let's pick up verse 11. When Peter came to himself, I guess we read verses 11 and 12. Oh, anyway, verse 12, he came to this house, the house of Mary, the mother of John called Mark, okay? The mother of John Mark, Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. Mom holds a prayer meeting at her house. And it says in verse 13, when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate, and they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brethren. And then he left and went to another place. That's just one of the funniest accounts you find anywhere in Scripture. 
If I could give a descriptive phrase of the verses we just read, it would be the power of imperfect prayer. And there ought to be some encouragement in what we read here. How much faith do we need to have for God to answer prayer if these verses are in the indication then apparently we don't have to have a lot of faith for God to answer prayer? Again, that ought to be encouraging to us. Because I want you to look at their faith on display here. They're praying for Peter while he's in prison. We don't know exactly what they're praying for, but probably for his release, for his safety nevertheless. And so Peter is miraculously broken out of jail, shows up where the prayer meeting is taking place. This servant girl named Rhoda hears him knocking at the door of the gate and is so flabbergasted, she leaves him knocking at the gate, goes back in, tells the group that are praying that Peter's there, and notice their response, you're out of your mind. How much faith did they have? Peter's here, oh, that's not possible. It's his angel. It's got to be explained in some other way. It can't be Peter. Peter continues to knock on the door of the gate, it says. They finally let him in. And it occurs to me that it was probably a lot easier to get Peter out of prison than it was to get him into the prayer meeting, wasn't it? You know, isn't that ironic? <laughs> no problem getting out of jail. The angel let him right out. But the people in the prayer meeting leave him at the door knocking, not letting him come in. Well, he does finally get to come in. They are amazed. Again, maybe a thought about their faith. He quiets them down. I imagine it got just a little bit noisier for a while. Ah, Peter's here. He was in prison, and now he's here. And so he explains about his miraculous jailbreak. And then he says, report all this to James. We might pause and say, wait a minute. Herod killed James. Probably not the same James. James, the brother of John, probably he's saying, report to James, the half-brother of Jesus, who's the human author of the book of James. So we have probably two different James here. Now, verses 18 to 23, I'm not going to read that, but I want you to just follow along here, and let's take a look at the narrative and what happened. It says there's no small disturbance back at the prison. That's an understatement, probably deliberately so in the text. There was a huge commotion. <laughs> Peter's not here. There were 16 guards watching. He was chained to two of them. In the middle of the night, somehow he got out. He's not here anymore. So no small disturbance indeed. And so there was a great commotion because he's not there and not to be found anywhere. It's a serious matter for a Roman guard to let the prisoner get away. And so apparently it is a death sentence for these guards, I assume for all six of them, it says they were led away to be executed. Then meanwhile, we come back to Herod, the guy who's very sympathetic toward the Jews, a guy who has a hatred toward the followers of Christ. We are told that somehow the people of Tyre and Sidon, that region of people, were upset and Herod was upset with them, I guess I should say. And that's significant because history tells us there was a food supply chain from Judea and Samaria to Tyre and Sidon. We all understand about supply chains. You disrupt that, you've got some serious problems. And so probably because he's upset with them, he's halted the supply chain of food coming in. And so something has got to be done to get this thing set right. So probably we can only imagine that some backroom political maneuvering took place and we read here that Herod makes, shall we say, a state visit. Now, the historian Josephus gives us some more detail as to what we would read here in Acts chapter 12. And Josephus, the historian, tells us that Herod indeed appeared before the people. He appeared in what was best described as a silver speckled robe, a robe that had actual pieces of silver in it. And so he appears outside, the sun no doubt gleaming off of him, reflecting off of this silver-specked robe. And if you look in the verses here, all oh, the voice of a God, not of men. As he's about to be seated on that throne, or was seated on the throne. And notice what happens with him after that. It says, because he didn't give glory to God, worms struck him down. And killed him. Probably some type of parasite. Josephus tells us a little bit more about that. Some parasites in his digestive system. And so, can't even begin to imagine the excruciating pain that he had. He didn't die right on the spot, as we might think maybe the text says here. But Josephus tells us five days later. So he had five days of, of horrible, horrible agony. 
and then he died. In fact, Josephus tells us it was the year A.D. 44. So we know exactly when it was that this man died, and that would have been about 12 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. A horrible way for one's life to end. 24 and 25, the last two verses of the, of the text here, we want to read those. I like this. But, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. An important ending to this chapter. A government leader, Herod in particular, goes on a killing spree, kills one of the leaders of the church. He has every intention of killing another. The church meets to pray, but as we read, the church prays imperfectly, but yet God still answers. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. And we read at the very end about Paul and Barnabas. They're about to go off on a world-changing mission. They're going to be turning the world upside down because the Gospels come down to us largely through their efforts. Indeed, the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Let's frame this chapter in today's terms. A pandemic upended lives and economies. A Russian dictator invaded a country and greatly impacted supply chains. The oil cartel cut production rates and increased gas prices. The stock market tumbled amidst rising inflation rates and the threat of recession. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Amen. That's the story brought down to us. It may not look like it as we look out at things in the world today. It probably didn't look that way back in the first century. Setbacks, problems, martyrdom. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Whether we see it or not, in faith we know it to be absolutely true. Whatever goes on in our crazy world today, but the word of the Lord continues to grow and to be multiplied. That's a great encouragement for us at the end of this chapter. We noted that James was killed, but Peter was miraculously spared. Does that create a dilemma in anyone's mind besides mine? Why was that? Why did James get killed and why not Peter? Was Peter more important to the work of the Lord than James? More necessary? Did the church not pray for James and they prayed for Peter and if they'd have prayed for James, would he have been spared? Why do some people die what we call an untimely death while others live prolonged lives? And isn't that a dilemma that many have thought about throughout the ages? Why are those things that way? Here's a thought to consider. I find it interesting. In Revelation 11, you don't need to turn there. I just want you to refer to this and think about this later. Revelation 11 talks about at the end of this age, there's going to be two great prophet figures that will be raised up. They're called the two witnesses. And uh, they will be amazing men. They will perform miracles like Elijah, as we read there. They will stop the rain as Elijah did. They'll be like Moses because it says they're going to turn water into blood. They're going to unleash plagues. And they're going to prophesy mightily the word of God. This verse I want you to notice, Revelation 11, verse 7, concerning these two witnesses, says, When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss makes war with them, conquers them, and kills them. When they finish their testimony, when they had finished their testimony, they were allowed to be killed. Here's just a thought, and I just throw it out there for our consideration. Is it possible that James's testimony had been finished and his life was allowed to be ended? We already noted about Peter that his testimony wasn't done. He was going to die as an old man by crucifixion. 
And so is it possible that when one's testimony is finished, perhaps their life is as well? I think it fits with the Apostle Paul. You know well his words at the end of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7, where he says, past tense, I have fought the good fight, I have finished, past tense, the race, I have kept the faith. Paul knew his testimony was finished. Paul knew he was about to die. Is that possibly an explanation for us to consider? It may not be the only explanation. Aside this side of the kingdom of God, I suppose it's not going to be clear, but I just thought it was worthwhile offering that thought to consider. But constant prayer was made is a very encouraging phrase we find here. We ought to find the power of imperfect prayer encouraging to us because we pray imperfectly as the church prayed imperfectly. I'm drawn back a passage I know you're familiar with. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, there's a man who has a boy that is possessed with a demonic spirit. The disciples are unable to cast it out. He comes to Jesus, and the man, the father of the boy, says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus answered, turning his words right back around, if you can... As if to say, this is outrageous. Everything is possible to the one who believes. And of course, we really can appreciate the response of the father. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. The mixture of faith and unbelief. And he's totally honest about it. I have believing faith. I believe, but yet there's a part of me that doesn't. I know it's clouded with unbelief. That is certainly the way the church is praying in Acts 12 that we read about. They believed in the power of prayer, but maybe they didn't believe enough in order that, that Peter was going to be miraculously released. And so God answers prayers that are not always offered in perfect faith. I think that principle is important to lift up and consider because it kind of gets a monkey off of our back, so to speak. Because you have probably heard it as I have. Well, if you just had more faith you know that prayer would have been answered. And what a horrible guilt trip. If you'd have just had more faith in praying for that sick person, they would have recovered and lived. And that's a terrible thing to say. These people didn't have perfect faith. God chose to answer their prayers. So as we pray imperfectly, God can choose to answer those prayers as well. Acts 12 that we just read begins with Herod, the Roman ruler, killing it ends with him being killed. And I think that is significant. Because powerful leaders and rulers are not the slightest challenge to the God who is well able to bring them down. It makes us think about the present day. Can God bring down a powerful madman who is waging a terrible, bloody war against his own people? He can, he may not. He does not always bring down the Hitlers in their time, but God certainly can, in a fallen world, bring them down if he so chooses. King Nebuchadnezzar is exhibit A. King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the, on the face of the earth in his day, ruler, absolute ruler of the Babylonian Empire. And if you know anything about the book of Daniel, God humbled him in a dramatic way. And so Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way, and he freely made this confession. And this is really outstanding for a powerful monarch to say this. Daniel 4, 37, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the King of heaven, because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Now he brought him down and didn't have to kill him. He humbled him. And he was able to exalt God. Herod was brought down. He was not humbled. He was literally taken out. God can do it. And God often does it. God holds the king's heart in his hand like a water wheel, we're told scripturally. God chooses to turn the heart of a leader any way he wants for his purposes. It is no big deal for God to bring down those who think they are high and mighty and proud. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Hang on to that. Even when wicked leaders seem to get their way, the word of the Lord continues to grow and be multiplied. Even when there are tragic deaths, the word of the Lord continues to grow and be multiplied. Even when setbacks seem apparent, 
The word of the Lord continues to grow and be multiplied. Even when we pray imperfectly, the word of the Lord continues to grow and to be multiplied. So I would say the thing we walk away with out of Acts 12 today is that whatever we face, no matter how things might appear, no matter which side seems to be winning in the world today, the word of the Lord continues to grow and to be multiplied. Amen? Amen. 